Thank you. I know that coffee and tea can act as necessary stimulant, and, uh, and it's also wonderful that you have so much, there's so much to discuss uh, in, in the, at the, during the break. There'll be plenty of time for chance for discussion again later, but now we move on to our second lecturer, who's Stephen Lubar. And it's a wonderful privilege to be able to introduce Steve here this afternoon. Stephen Lubar is professor of, um, of so many things. I'm going to read the many things. American studies, history, history of art and architecture uh, at Brown University, where he's been since 2004. And he's also had uh, additional responsibilities, which I'm sure he's grateful to have relinquished now, but uh, he has also been director of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage, a post he held for 10 years between 2004 and 2014, and director of the Hafenreffer Museum of Anthropology between 2010 and 2012. And that might sound like a short tenure, but it was absolutely vital because Steve brought the Hafenreffer Museum out from the cold in Bristol, Rhode Island, right into the center of, of uh, Brown University in Providence, uh, having a physical presence which was literally unavoidable uh, in, in the university. A tremendous achievement. I don't know how you manage that politically. <laughs> now, before moving to Brown in 2004, uh, Steve was chair of the Division of the History of Technology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American Art. So he's one of the fairly small group of people who really has spanned the museum and academic areas of scholarship. Um, so I feel a certain affinity with him from that, from that point of view. Last year, he was a Guggenheim Fellow. He's also a pr prolific author, and I will just mention a number of his, his books, uh, of which he was author or co-author, Legacies, Collecting America's History at the Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian Book of Information Age Inventions, History from Things, and Engines of Change, the American Industrial Revolution. Uh, he's also, of course, as a, 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 a long-term experienced museum curator, he has organized a number of important exhibitions, America on the Move, Smithsonian's America and Engines of Change. And he's also uh, organized a number of exhibitions, particularly student-involved uh, student exhibitions at Brown, uh, mm -hmm. at the Public Humanities Center, at the Hafenreffer, and at the John Hay Library. Uh, he has a wide, I would say, a wide, enviably wide range of interests. History of museums and memorials, material culture studies, mm -hmm not just a bit of material culture studies, but material culture studies to cool, and digital humanities, which is something that he shares with, uh, with David Jaffe. I also want to mention that he has a book coming out in the summer, and that book, which I can't, I honestly, I'm not just saying this, I can't wait to read, is called Inside the Lost Museum, Curating Past and Present, and that will appear in the summer. So, please join me in welcoming Stephen Luba. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, like the previous speakers, I just want to say a few words about David Jaffe, who invited us to, to speak. and who inspired the, some of the work that, that you've been hearing about this afternoon. Uh, David's historical work was on culture and commerce, and he approached those topics in both traditional ways, and especially in the last decade or so, a range of innovative new ways. Museum display, material culture, new media, and interesting, and always an interest in pedagogy. So I've tried to be inspired by his work here to think about how to consider both historically and using new media one aspect of New York's commerce and culture. As you've heard already, David was very clear about the importance of collaborating with students and acknowledging their work. So let me thank uh, Emily Estin, my research assistant on this project, um, 
and Stephanie Gomez, a computer science student at Brown who did some of the computer work, and of course the Brown University Center for the for Digital Scholarship, uh, who helped out made some of this possible. To say this work is inspired by and based on this one book, which you can see in the uh, in the exhibition next door. Um, it's the official catalog of the New York Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations. I'll get to it later uh, in some detail, in excruciating detail perhaps. <laughs> um, but what I want to do is start off with the history of museum catalogs. That'll be the first part of the talk. Then I'll talk about exhibitionary culture in New York City in the 1840s <coughs> and 50s. Sort of the, the, so these are the two contexts of, of this catalog, sort of tracing it back in two different ways. And then I'll think about the ways that this catalog in the Crystal Palace redefined the museum catalog. And finally, I'll try to apply some new tools of digital humanities and think about this catalog as a database. Uh, see how we can say this is a database that we can explore in new kinds of ways. So the, the first topic, of course, is the catalog. And the big question here is, how do we describe an exhibition? An exhibition in real life are multimedia, multi-sensory places. They are full of objects that you can see in many different ways. You can describe in many different ways. Um, the objects are organized and displayed in a way that's important. You see them from different directions. You see them next to different things. Um, they can be behind uh, velvet ropes or they can be inside of cases. They can have people standing next to them explaining what's going on or in a place like the Crystal Palace uh, trying to sell you these things. Um, all of that is lost in the museum catalog. Also lost is the audience that you would participate with when you were at, uh, at an exhibition. Um, visitors and exhibitions are constantly making choices, constantly trying to figure out what to look at next, what to, what to, what to, to see, what to do. Um, none of that is captured in the museum exhibition catalog. They have a variety of purposes though. For those who don't go to the fair or who are thinking about going to the fair, there are teas. You know, here's what you might see. Come and see this fair. Um, for those who visit, catalogs can be a guidebook. Here's what you can see as you go through the fair. Um, they're useful after the exhibition, of course. You take them home to remember what you saw. Um, and if you can't make it at all, you can imagine the catalog for many exhibits as a stand-in. This is what happened, this is how we remember what's there. And of course, for historians, after the fact, it's very useful for understanding what went on. The, the thing that makes fair so interesting to look at is that they are a uh, moment of carefully considered choices, a moment of a curated selection of objects that seemed worth saving, worth talking about, uh, worth showing off. So catalogs are very useful. Now, I, my next line of my talk is, there's not much written on museum catalogs. And this is the one audience that scares me to say that because <laughs> there probably are people here who know more about this. Uh, but there's very, I have yet to find a really good description of the, of the history. They are um, mentioned the very first book about museums, uh, Samuel Kitchenberg's Inscriptiones of 1565, mentions that if you have a collection, this is sort of a guide to collectors, uh, you might want a catalog of the books and coins in your collection, but not a public catalog. Uh, this famous picture that has to be in every museum history talk um, <laughs> of the Ole Worms Museum, um, it's from a catalog of his collection published shortly after his death in 1654. Um, in some ways, it's the first thing that looks like a museum catalog that I know of. That's one of the things that makes this a modern museum. Uh, but it's more of a scholarly work of, that happens to be about the things in the, in the museum rather than about the museum. The first modern museum catalog, which is a checklist, a thing that um, Fritz Kears, who has written on the history of museum catalogs, writes, he says this has all the essential features of a modern, a modern art museum catalog. That's from the Louvre, 1793. It has uh, a printed list of objects in the collection in systematic order. In this case, 
in the order that you would see things in the museum, and descriptions that facilitate identification of the objects by the public. This is what you would carry with you as you went through the museum. Now, the first museum catalog in the United States that I've been able to find is with really the first major museum in the United States, um, Peel's Museum in Philadelphia. <coughs> he says, he describes this in his 1796 catalog as a scientific and descriptive catalog of the museum. And his goals were to be, quote, as useful as possible and to excite a taste for the science of natural history. It was intended to be useful not only for those who visit the museum, but also to those who already, having some general acquaintance with natural history, may wish to give the subject a more particular attention. So this is really the catalog, like the worm catalog earlier, uh, the catalog is teaching tool. Uh, it was a textbook rather than just a guide to the exhibits, or at least as much as a guide to the exhibits. Uh, the other kind of, of catalog, this is a, maybe the second grand type, um, this is the 1821 catalog of the, uh, called the Catalog of the Articles in the Museum of the East India Marine Society. This is in Salem, <coughs> Massachusetts, one of the pre precursors of the Peabody Essex Museum of today. This is very different kind of use of a catalog. This is all of the objects in the collection in the order that they came to the museum with the donors listed, um, with some exceptions, shells and um, and minerals are listed in a scientific cata category by genus and species. Coins are listed in chronological order, except sort of fascinating Chinese coins, which have, are outside of history somehow and so have no <laughs> chronological order. Um, so this is really more of an inventory for the use of the museum to acknowledge donors than as a guide to visiting the, the museum. <coughs> I think its purpose is probably as much to brag about the collections uh, as to explain them. Um, here in, in New York, um, in 1821, 1825 rather, the New York Anatomical Museum, which was part of the College of Physicians and Surgeons, published a guide to their collections. This is a, a third type of, of exhibition catalog. Let me quote from the introduction. Public utility and the advancement of science are the great objects of all cabinets. Every method, therefore, which may promote these ends should be adopted. That meant, first of all, good organization and explanation. And in this catalog here, which was aimed at students, quote, they may see what the collection contains and that they may know what they'd see. This is the sort of catalog you would carry into the museum and you would get an explanation. And here are the lovely things that you could see in, in the museum. Um, this is what students were learning about and medical students were learning about. So the most fascinating catalog that I had, didn't, had not known about before is this catalog from the Boston's 1845 Chinese Museum. This I think is a fourth type of catalog this is a catalog that is a description of the exhibition itself. Um, it's the first one that I found that really does that. Um, it has on the sides here, I'll point out this wonderful expression, which I offered to the Bard Graduate Center as a motto. Um, it says, words may deceive, but the eye cannot play the rogue. You've got to see the truth by, by looking at actual objects. Um, so here's the, the point of this one is that uh, with the aid of this catalog, visitors will get a better knowledge of this curious people than can be acquired by reading the most faithful descriptions alone, or even by a transient visit to China. Um, the Chinese Museum had several incarnations. It was in Philadelphia, it was then in Boston, it was in New York, uh, then moved to London. This gives you a sense of the scale. There's thousands and thousands of Chinese objects on display. Um, the museum directed visitors, the catalog, excuse me, directed visitors through the museum by numbered displays. Um, it described the dioramas in great detail. It said the, the descriptions are, um, let me go back to that. Uh, here's what you'll see. Um, uh, the diorama of Chinese mandarins, for example, 
uh, describes the meaning of their clothes, and then proceeds to discuss their training and education in China more generally. It included Chinese voices in the catalog, with quotes from Chinese writings and from travel writers, and ex excerpts from histories about China. It's 200 pages long, this catalog, and it was designed to serve as an introduction to China and Chinese history through the exhibition. Um, that, that's uh, the diorama of the, of the in, in one of the dioramas in the museum. Uh, the Natural History Museums have a separate tradition of catalogs. Um, this is the minerals catalogs are actually fairly common and look very modern uh, in shell collections. But most of the catalogs are this kind of thing. Uh, this is Spencer Baird, the uh, undersecretary of the Smithsonian, uh, present, does two books like this, Mammals of North America and Birds of North America. And he's um, using the collections to talk about the natural history of the continent. Um, he's not talking about the collections themselves. They're just uh, there to be used. So let me move now to the exhibitions of mid-century New York, the, the immediate context of the Crystal Palace and think about how they were portrayed in, in catalogs. David Jaffe gave a talk at the opening of an ex exhibit visualizing New York a couple of years ago. He said, 1850s New York was a visual experience, a spectacle. One of the key elements of that spectacle, one of the things that made the city modern, was the prominence of places where things were put on display. Modern stores offered arrays of objects for visitors to examine and to purchase. And many of these stores published catalogs and broadsides that would advertise what was there. Um, some of these were the sorts of places David wrote about, the visual culture. This is the um, Apple, Appleton's stereograph store. Uh, this is Appleton's bookstore. Again, museum-like spaces <coughs> with listings, with catalogs of what's on display. Um, Broadway, uh, Broadway Palace is what people talked about, these grand uh, emporia, the grand stores uh, that would look to my eye very much like a museum. Um, since Walt Whitman has to be in every talk, um, <laughs> uh, Walt Whitman writes this wonderful uh, description of these Broadway palaces. The, it goes on for pages with these descriptions of things you could buy on Broadway. Um, it struck me actually as a wonderful exhibition for the Bart Graduate Center someday. Um, there were not that many museums or art galleries in New York City before 1850. Uh, Carrie Ribora Barrett, in her book on New York City exhibitions, describes the new city in this period, she's talking about 1830s and 40s, uh, early 50s, as a place with very few experts mostly impromptu exhibitions and dubious auctions. There were two major art institutions, the American Academy of Fine Art and the National Academy of Design, but they didn't have their own buildings. They dis had displays in store windows, uh, hospitals, patrons' park parlors, and other spots like that. The National Academy did these occasional exhibitions and also occasional catalogs of these exhibitions. Uh, these were clearly intended to be carried as guides into the exhibition. Um, there are some that are simple explanations. And then many paintings given a little bit more context. In this case, a poem that you're supposed to read as you look at, at the painting. Uh, the Dusseldorf Gallery, which opened in 1849, uh, has a catalog of its the space. This is the, the, the Dusseldorf Gallery. It's quite wonderful. It put out a, a catalog of the paintings there that were that were on display, and it's a very curious thing. It begins with ten pages of descriptions from the what it calls extracts of the press of New York that describe the exhibit. Mostly, it, basically all of the great reviews it got. They list them all in there. 
Um, and then for almost every painting, there's an excerpt from a, a review, a book of, uh, or a, a, an article about the exhibition that says why this is good and why you should like this painting. Um, um, you can get a sense of this here. The, this, the, the painting is described as admirable as a composition and full of lifelike and startling contrast. There is history and character in every personage. In some ways, this is a sales catalog for a market that is not quite sure what good art is. This is a way of describing what, what you might want to buy. Some paintings have several pages of this kind of description. Um, so these are, these are catalogs that are trying co to convince you of something. There were other kinds of exhibitions and museums in New York City behind Beyond Art, but the city was very aware that there was not enough here that there should be. In 1852, there's a New York Times article that says, there is nothing that strikes the foreigner with greater surprise than the total absence of anything like public institutions in the city of New York. In European cities, everywhere you go, there are public displays. There's museums, picture galleries, libraries, botanical gardens, zoological collections, free to all comers, and particularly interesting in tour to tourists. <coughs> New York, and I love this, the next great city of the world has only Barnum. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not completely true. There were a lot of museum-like places. Um, the Phrenological Museum, the Fowler's Phrenological Museum, looked was you could get your head read there, but you could also go and just look at skulls and look at the um, look at at, at um, some of the models that they had um, in Brooklyn. And I'll get to this later. There was the Naval Lyceum. There were annual exhibitions. Uh, this is the American Institute in 1845. Um, it would have its fairs every so often. And there was Barnum. Barnum is always a challenge for museum history. It doesn't quite fit in our usual uh, ways of thinking about museum history. But like the other museums and exhibitionary spaces, Barnum put out a catalog. It's not surprisingly a little bit different from the others, although based in some ways perhaps on the, the Chinese museum. Um, it is, I should say, surprisingly mild-mannered for, for the reputation that the Barnum Museum has. Uh, it's a guide. It's, you can carry it through the exhibition. But it actually, I think, may have been designed for those who never made it to the show as well. Uh, the, it cost you 25 cents to get into the museum. You could buy the catalog for 12 and a half cents. Barnum made some good money either way. So it describes a visit to the museum rather than the museum itself. So you read things like, the power of the lodestone is shown to us in a very amusing manner. Or, in this room, the visitor sees kind of descriptions. So a non-visitor would get a clear sense of what it was like to visit the museum from, the, from this catalog. The Brooklyn Naval Lyceum was at the Navy Yard. Oops, that's another page from the, uh, from the Barnum catalog. Brooklyn Naval Lyceum was, may have well have been after Barnum the largest museum in New York. Um, nobody knows about it, uh, and it's one of my favorite unknown museums. Um, it was done by naval officers who would um, bring stuff back from around the world and put it on display at the Navy Yard in Brooklyn. It issued what I think is probably the, one of the longest catalogs of, of this era. Um, it's hard to find because it was issued in um, separate as articles in the U.S. nautical magazine, uh, but several hundred pages again total over a couple of years in the 1850s of uh, the iconographic catalog of, of, the, of the Lyceum. It is of the type of catalog that is not so much about here's what you will see in the museum, but rather we will use the things in the museum to teach you about the world. Uh, it's an encyclopedic catalog rather than a, a guide catalog. There's another couple of pages to show you the sorts of things that were there. Um, so there's a quick background of the Crystal Palace. Into this scene of this modern US ex exhibitionary culture just getting started is, is 
enters the, the New York Crystal Palace. Um, you've heard a lot about it already, so I won't go into the details about the palace, but just to give you a sense of the ways in which it was uh, made available to the public. And of course, you can see this all at the exhibition next door. Must have been the most photographed, most described catalog uh, exhibition of any in the US to that day, uh, probably of any anywhere other than the London Crystal Palace. It was photographed, uh, material culture produced, uh, prizes given out. Um, there are about, according to the bibliography of the fair, there's at least 32 official and semi-official publications um, in a range of categories, um, opening at, uh, organizational materials, opening addresses, and the like. Um, I'm going to focus only on things that seem like museum catalogs, these um, the organizational materials and the uh, um, guides, and thinking about them as kinds of records and experiences of a museum-like exhibition. A um, little bit of, of sort of backing off here, a little bit of theory, um, Lev Manovich, uh, writes a wonderful article called Database as Symbolic Form. He offers a way to think about catalogs and guides as two kinds of ways of describing the world, as database and as narrative. Um, database and narrative, he writes, are natural enemies. Competing for the same territory of human culture, each claims an exclusive right to make meaning out of the world. He suggests that databases are a modern replacement for narrative. I think that in museum work, they have long been complementary. Let me start with, with a guide. This is a day in the New York Crystal Palace and how to make the most of it. Um, it's written by William Richards, who was also the editor of the official catalog of the fair. Um, he starts this guide with an introduction, with an, uh, an introduction that compares the two forms of catalog. The official catalog, he writes, indispensable in itself as a complete and sim systematic inventory of the thousands of objects embraced in the Great Exhibition, is yet, in the very nature of the case, deficient in that sort of information concerning the chief attractions of the palace which the visitor requires, which is a wonderful description of the comparison between the database and the narrative. This guide, Richard's guide, is designed to be carried with you as you go through the fair. Um, the bibliographer Coleman writes, you carry it, walk through, pausing here and there, to deliver, the, the describing this catalog, it says, delivers what now seem some very poor jokes and woefully inane puns, <laughs> which is true. Uh, he's trying to enliven what is really a very random selection of, of objects that you can see in the exhibition. It was designed so you could see as much as you can in the shortest time possible. Um, and it um, reveals just how odd the juxtaposition, juxtapositions of the fair must have been. Uh, a day at the Crystal Palace, this, this, this uh, exhibition, this, this guide was banned for sale at, at the palace. You weren't allowed to buy this there. And I'm not sure why that was. Um, perhaps by suggesting a path that was defeating the very purpose of the fair, of which was to be equally, having all of these things equally available. Um, it privileged some displays more than others. It might also have been taking business, <coughs> business away from the gentlemen who were selling their services as a tour guide. There was another uh, guide like this that took the other approach. It was a very commercial guide. Um, you bought an advertisement, your work was included in, in, the, in the guide to the fair. Um, one more quick look at another, oops, um, another of these guidebooks. Uh, this is a very opinionated, um, not an official take on things. Uh, it's happy to tell you what's good and what's bad. This comes from the, the second incarnation of the fair after P.T. Barnum took it over. Um, and it's very much a sense of, here's what I find interesting, here's what you should look at. Um, don't worry about seeing everything. 
So let's move on from, uh, oops, that's another description of the fair. So let's move on to the, to the more database-like uh, catalogs of the fair. We're gonna look at two of these. Um, the first is this fascinating, um, the world of science, art, and industry illustrated from examples of the New York exhibition. So this was not a guide to the fair. This was an encyclopedia, much like the Brooklyn Naval Lyceum uh, catalog, that was designed to build on the fair to teach you important things, um, give you a sense of the, of the table of contents. Uh, it does, it's two things, and it's an odd book. It was printed at two separate ways. Some of it was printed live at the fair, just the pictures of things that were at the fair, and some of it was done separately, then they were merged together at the end. So that the two parts of the exhibition, you can see the, uh, of the, uh, the book, on the left here is just a history of the cotton gin, and on the right, I'm connected to it, are things you could see at the fair. Uh, these two kinds of catalog merged into one. Um, and then it had no advertisements, but what they would do to, to be able to sell this is that, um, oops, for the other catalog, you could wasn't you couldn't buy an advertisement in the catalog itself. You could buy a uh, an insert into it to uh, to sell to uh, to sell your goods at the fair. Okay, so now I want to go back to the catalog I started off that really inspired this talk. Um, this is the official catalog. Um, it's pure database. It starts, well, I should say, there is a separate catalog that came out a little bit later of the pictures at the fair, which I won't go into very much. The catalog is, has a map at the beginning, uh, two maps, uh, saying where each of the exhibits are. Um, so you can find your way around. But most of it is uh, listings by class or industrial group of the objects you could see. The, the catalog is first divided by country, and then within each country by, um, by industrial grouping. And you can see here the sorts of things and the, the categories that they had. Um, the editor gives instructions on how to use the catalog. Let me quote, the visitor should pursue, on passing through the building, the order in which it presents the countries. As an object meets his eyes, he will notice its class and serial numbers, and reference to the following pages will at once put him in possession of all the information that, all the information concerning the object. Seems an unlikely way that somebody would have used the fair. Um, we can imagine instead that the organization of the fair was really a way of promoting the goals of the fair. Um, the goals, the catalog states, were to draw forth such a representation of the world's industry and resources as would enable us to measure the strength and value of our own, while it indicated new aims for our enterprise and skills. So if you're concerned about commerce and trade and showing off the rest of the world, that's why you organize things by country rather than by category. the quote that I just read to you about how best to use it. Let me move on. This is a typical page of the catalog. Um, so this is under uh, the United States section. Um, descriptions, what's there, where the people are, where they're from. Um, there's a, this is, goes on for hundreds of pages. You can see a wonderful exhibit technique next door with the pages and pages of this blown up on the wall over there. Um, let me end by just thinking about how we can use this as a pure database. Um, what my students have done is taken that very nice catalog, which turns out to be in pretty good shape when you do an optical character recognition search on it. You can clean it up and get a pretty good Google spreadsheet of 4,000 objects that were on display at the fair. Once you have that, you can start to play with it in all sorts of interesting ways. And this last part of the talk is really more, here's some possibilities, because we're still trying to, to get this all done. But 
I'll end with just a few of those possibilities. Um, so this is the, where we were. This is organized by, as it was in the catalog, the, uh, the official printed catalog, by <coughs> country and then uh, by um, category. And I've color coded some of these to make it a little bit easier to figure out what's going on. But you get a very different sense of things if you organize it by category and then by country. And you get a different feel of what was really there. You can start to understand it better. As you start to, to code it, you start to see some of the groups of things that were there and what wasn't there. And you can start to see that sort of visually it becomes apparent in that catalog. You can start to, to analyze it statistically. Who was really there? Um, you see about half was US. Um, a big chunk Germany and the UK, and then a few um, outliers. You could also start to get a sense of where things are located there, because each item has the place on the map. And I won't, I have, I can show this slide, but I can wait to do that later. Um, one of my students has pulled together this where you can say, show me all the things from the United States in, or in this case, from Germany, or all the things in this category, and where would you see these things? You can start to get a feeling for what it would be like in the, in the fair. Um, uh, trying to get a sense of more detailed localities. Some of the data starts to fall apart when we do this, but um, where are there places with lots going on? Of course, New York City uh, is the single highest, but you can start to get a feel of this. I've also started to make some maps of where things are. Um, organized here by category, so the colors represent um, the different types of things on display. And you can start to see where they are, uh, what, what countries, what parts of the United States are producing, what kinds of, of, uh, of goods for display. And finally, you can start to see uh, some of the ways in which different countries show off different categories of their goods. Um, again, the colors show the different kinds of, of things on display. Another way of pursuing that. Um, finally, there's a project that I'm trying to figure out. Many of the, um, of the entries say that there's an agent involved. Agents are mostly from New York, but not all of them. And who are these agents? What was their role? There's about um, a dozen or 20 different categories of agents, inventors, manufacturers. We can start to play with this data in a way to, to understand that as well. Um, this gives us a sense of the density in New York City. Uh, there are addresses for many of these, um, which are a little bit difficult to use, but you can start to get a sense of where industry was in New York City at the time. And uh, finally, all of the agents, all of the the, um, of the entries shown uh, by, by place. So that gives you just a sense of what it is that I'm uh, trying to play with, thinking of this as database, sort of going back to the, this original sense that the compiler of the catalog must have had of, I wish I had a computer to, to do this work better. Thank you. Before we, before we move on to the general discussion, uh, I think there's time just for a couple of pressing questions. Yes. Yes. Um, I appreciate all this research. Is, I mean, how far you went <coughs> with it. So I'm wondering, would, could you pull out for us um, which countries or which um, innovations came about uh, significantly during that time? Um, so the important inventions at, on display at the fair, um, sort of a mishmash of what's important to the, to the, to the country. And, and there's the historical writing about the fair suggests that in fact it was not a very, it did not really show off the, the most important American inventions of the day. Singer's sewing machine was there, one of the key things. Um, uh, the cotton gin was there. But things like machinery and locomotives were not part of the fair. And that, that was missing from, from you may have not just, may have been not easy to get that on, on to display. Uh, the, what comes in from around the world is quite spotty. 
again, tied to agents who want to sell things in New York City. This was designed not to show off <coughs> German or British industry generally, but to be thinking about how to sell these to a new audience in the, in, in the United States. So it would be something that can be transported, transitioned. Very nice. Yes? Uh, I didn't quite hear that first question. Speak up. Maybe I'm overlapping. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. I was wondering, do you know anything about the, <clears throat> the organizers of the exhibition and how they chose those people and what? I mean, I understand what you've, you've plucked out mm -hmm. from all of this data, but, but why was it that way? My, I think I'll turn that over to some of the students who turn that over to some of the students who worked on that project, who will know much more about that than I. Uh, it was open. They tr they encouraged lots of uh, of uh, manufacturers to send their material. Uh, there were agents that were sent to England and Germany to encourage uh, companies to provide material for the fair, but there was not a. Uh, I, I haven't seen the letters saying, here's what you will get out of it by, by being here. I, just to follow up, mm -hmm. I mean, it looked like it was at least half American. Yes. Uh, whereas in the Crystal Palace in London, what's the, I'm just curious about what the, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know the percentage. Half British, so the same. Was it half British? Mm -hmm. yeah. One more. Okay. I think one more before our general discussion. Yes, at the back. Um, I'm wondering if you know how much the guidebook cost, and was it, or was it part of the admission? Where could you buy it? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, the big guidebook, the illustrated guidebook that I showed briefly, was a very expensive book to buy. Uh, and in fact, the first three or four pages are the publisher saying why this book is so expensive, how much it costs to produce. Uh, I spent $40,000 to make this book, uh, so you should appreciate it. My, I don't know where you'd buy the, 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 the guides, I assume, except for that one that I know is not available for sale. You'd want to buy this at the at the catalog at the exhibition. Uh, on the other hand, it would also serve if you were a manufacturer or an importer. You would want this as a reference work later on as well. So, what was the publication run? If you uh, is there any oh, idea? Publication runs are always very hard to tell for books. Um, so, I don't know the answer. Let's thank Steve Lubar for this wonderful talk.